Monica is a political science major and a history minor on the pre-law track in the MCAS Honors Program. She is on the advanced standing plan and is in her second year of three at Boston College. At BC, Monica is a teaching assistant for the Business Law Department and participates in mock trial. In mock trial, UGBC, the Pre-Law Society Board, and the dance group on tap. Today, she'll be discussing the issue of free speech on college campuses, specifically here at BC. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Monica. Uh, thank you, Moosh, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming here today. I'd also like to thank BC Talks in general for letting me exercise my right to free speech to tell you all about your rights to free speech. So, as Moosh just said, my name is Monica Cassia, and I am here today to talk to you about the issue of the silencing of free speech on college campuses, and specifically here at Boston College, as well as to propose some solutions to this issue. So, I hope that my exercising of free speech today empowers all of you to use your voices within the university community to make it a better place. So, I'd like to begin with a quote from English writer Evelyn Beatrice Hall, who once wisely stated that, I disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Now, this epitomizes the basic principle of free speech that our nation holds so dear, as it's one of the cornerstones of American democracy. In fact, as we all know, the Founding Fathers thought that freedom of speech was so important that they made it the first amendment to the highest law in the land. Now, as a political science major, I've been told time and time again that the Bill of Rights, including the freedom of speech, only applies to governments throughout the United States, not to private institutions such as universities like Boston College. And furthermore, I understand that by agreeing to come to Boston College, we incur the responsibility to respect the values that this institution stands for. But in my opinion, that shouldn't give a university such as Boston College free reign to censor everything that comes out of its students' mouths. And the highest court in the land happens to agree with that statement. Now, in the fashion of a true pre-law student, I have a favorite Supreme Court case. And that case is Tinker versus the Independent School District of Des Moines, which is the reigning precedent in the United States for free speech in, in, in the educational setting. And this precedent states that students do not shed their constitutional rights to free speech or free expression at the schoolhouse gate. Now, this is my favorite free, uh, Supreme Court case because of the fact that it embodies the principle that American education should be a place where people can freely debate and discuss ideas without being feared, without fearing any punishment. However, over the past few decades, American universities have since strayed from this precedent, largely as a result of the political correctness movement of the 1980s and 1990s. In an effort to preserve their public images, universities began imposing speech codes, which in some way limit or restrict what students can say on their college campuses. According to the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, as of 2016, out of the 400 plus top colleges and universities in the United States, over 49% of them in some way restrict student speech based on its content. And the problem with policies like these is that it implicitly presumes that the university is the final and infallible judge of what is right, and therefore, everything else is automatically wrong. So how exactly do policies like these actually take hold in a university setting? Well, speaking generally on a national level, they can manifest themselves in various forms, such as trigger warnings on certain university classes, prohibitions on microaggressions, disinviting controversial speakers from coming to talk on campus, banning provocative literature in libraries, and disallowing offensive or unwelcome speech. Now, there are several problems with policies like these. And the first is that if we look at that last one, offensive or unwelcome speech, these are extremely ambiguous and vague terms. So what is perceived as offensive to one student could simply be free expression to another student. And furthermore, another problem with policies like these is the fact that they are not, uh, they are not adjudicated on a standard basis, meaning that the university can completely go against what it was saying for one case and completely change that precedent for another case. So, so in all, this is not protection. This is censorship in its rawest form. So with policies like these, we've in effect brought speech up to the same level as violence, in that we punish it, and that we regulate it, and that we simply fear it. However, this is simply not within the university's rights in order to do so. Because the fact remains that suppressing free speech goes against the university's mission of preparing people for the real world. So but let's take another look at what the purpose of a university actually is. Well, of course, the answer to that question varies depending on the type of the institution. But all institutions of higher learning, 
serve as a stepping stone between an individual's education and between their success in the real world. But how are students supposed to enter the real world when they've been shielded from controversial issues right before they enter it? The fact that a university can harshly punish a student for promoting that very university's purpose of promoting diverse ideas on campus simply perverts the notion on free speech that this nation and our education system were so proudly founded upon. So we have to realize that universities are simply not justified in prohibiting speech just because it is controversial or unpopular. Yesterday's minority opinions just might be the majority opinions of tomorrow. And the fact that students are too afraid to speak up might prevent the great ideas from the future from materializing. That simply is far too tragic of a possibility to ignore. So now that we've looked at the issue on a national level, we can narrow our scope to talking about free speech on the Boston College campus. So before we do, I just wanna make the disclaimer that I'm not here to criticize the administration of Boston College or the university as a whole, nor am I advocating for the right to free speech to include things like hate speech or defamation or blackmail, things that actually can hurt another person. So with that said, we'll begin with looking at the rights that the university actually does recognize us to have with regards to free speech and free expression. So according to our state of, statement of rights and responsibilities, all student members of the VC community have certain rights, which include the right to express opinion, the right to state agreement and disagreement. And along that same thread, we also have an obligation to refrain from restricting the free speech rights of others. This provision also extends to the faculty of Boston College through the right to academic freedom, which is the third thing on this slide, which shows that teachers are allowed to teach what they like in the classroom without the pressure from university officials. Now, the fact that we have these policies in place may seem like a beneficial thing for free speech, but as is the case with many policies, the letter of the law and its application don't see eye to eye. Despite that we have these in place, the freedom of speech at Boston College is not truly a freedom. Unfortunately, the university has imposed several restrictions and limits on student speech that in effect quell scholarship and innovation on this campus. So let's look at these policies a little more specifically. The first one I'd like to talk about today is the demonstration policy that we have on campus. Now the fact that there is one in place is definitely a beneficial thing to free speech. But if we look at this policy a little more closely, we realize that the university has a right to intervene at student protests along every step of the way. As this policy states, you must get a permit for your demonstration 48 hours before you protest. And furthermore, the university retains a right to regulate the time, place, and manner of your protest. Now, the way that we saw this manifest itself took place last year on our campus. And as this picture shows, this was the die-in protest that was in St. Mary's last year, where people which included students and faculty that were protesting the police brutality going on in the United States during that time. Now, according to the Heights, these students, who were accompanied by faculty, as it's very important to know, were told that they could face disciplinary sanctions and punishment for what they did, just because their protest wasn't approved ahead of time. This is definitely just one of the ways that free speech violations manifest themselves on our campus. Now, the second policy that I want to talk about is the posting policy here at BC. This is promulgated by the Office of Student Involvement. Now, in order to become, or sorry, in order to post a flyer on campus, you need to be approved as a student organization. And in order to become a student organization, you have to go through a very rigorous procedure and have to have your values align with the mission of the university, which means that you have to adhere to all of the Jesuit Catholic values that the university puts forth. Now, this policy has several implications. This first means that if you are an individual who is not part of a student group, you are not allowed to post a flyer on campus, even if it aligns with the Jesuit Catholic mission. And furthermore, even if you are a student, or, or even if you want to post something and you are part of a group, it doesn't guarantee you the right to post anything, because it could be in violation of the Jesuit Catholic values that this university sets forth. And this posting policy isn't only limited to the public environments of the university, but is also expanding into the residential life area. Their Office of Residential Life also has a policy in place saying that it is allowed to remove whatever flyers and posters that it deems necessary both in the bedrooms of students as well as common living areas. So for example, we have a policy in place by ResLife that states that you cannot have an advertisement of any type of alcohol in your room. But just having a poster of alcohol in your room doesn't necessarily mean that you are consuming it. And a way that I saw this personally take place last year was living in Medeiros Hall as a freshman. And the residents of Medeiros Hall C, which was the male division of the dorm, were instructed by the Res Life officials to take down certain posters in their dorm. So they were demanded by Res Life that they had to take down posters of models as well as movie posters of Scarface and The Godfather. 
but they were allowed to leave up posters that advocated for the Communist Party and for the Wu-Tang Clan. So I don't know about any of you, but this seems to defy all logic for me. And the final policy that I want to talk about is one of the Office for Institutional Diversity, which prohibits bias-motivated speech and conduct. So this is things like offensive jokes and microaggressions and other vague and ambiguous terms that can be construed depending on who is listening to them. Now the important thing about this policy is that it is elevating speech to the same level as things like hate crimes and sexual harassment, which means that people can get the same punishment for a speech violation as these things that are actual conduct violations. And the fact that it has very vague terms in it means that the contours of this policy are left up to the university to determine and is in effect an ambiguous and vague policy that simply limits our free speech. So now that we've talked about this issue, we need to look at how we can solve it. So the most obvious solution to this is to repeal policies, free speech policies that restrict our free speech and instead adopt comprehensive policies guaranteeing the right to free speech, expression, and free assembly. Now, obviously, this isn't going to get done in one day and is cons consistently a procedure. So we can do things that will help to bring back our free speech rights on campus, such as looking at the demonstration policy again. So perhaps the administration could make it more of a two-way conversation instead of, instead of a blatant rejection or um, acceptance of the demonstration. And furthermore, the university might want to consider allowing individuals to post flyers. So, over the last year, I've been part of a UGBC task force known as the incubator phase that actually works to do what this last bullet point states. And if it's approved, it will allow individuals who want to become part of a student group the right to post flyers as well as reserve rooms on campus. So although this doesn't fix the problem entirely, it's definitely a step in the right direction as well as these other suggestions. But Aside from these concrete solutions, when looking at the issue of free speech, it's imperative that the university take another look at its values. So according to the bylaws and statutes of the university, it is the purpose of Boston College to have respect for truth and freedom of inquiry for attaining truth. And now this right here is the basis of a liberal arts education. But how can we know if the truth is actually the truth if it can't stand up to constant criticism and debate? Philosopher John Stuart Mill said that if the truth is not consistently debated and interrogated from both sides of the spectrum, it can no longer be considered a truth. The fact remains that the university has an objective standard for what the truth is, and anyone who disagrees with it simply is not allowed to have a voice. Now, to end on a more personal note, I came to Boston College about a year and a half ago from a public high school in New Jersey, which aside from having the best bagels and beaches in the United States, also has some of the most restrictive educational speech codes in the United States as well. We have a law in place there known as the Harassment, Intimidation, and Bullying Law, and people are get in trouble and get punished under that law all the time for things like jokes and microaggressions that are not perceived as offensive to them, but are perceived as offensive to other students. And I definitely had a few run-ins with this policy during my time in high school as a very vocal and opinionated student. So that's why I was excited to come to Boston College, because I thought I would be able to freely proclaim my opinions no matter how unpopular or contentious they were. But sadly, that has not been the case here. Despite that the university has given me innumerable opportunities and I'm extremely grateful to them for doing so, the fact remains that the policies in place have an objective determination of what is right and everyone else simply is not given a voice on this campus. And I don't think that's why we invested thousands upon thousands of dollars to come to Boston College just to have our opinions shut down. We came to college to be exposed to a marketplace of lifestyles and ideas. We came to college to broaden our field of vision, not to narrow it to one set ideology. We came to college because we were not afraid to learn. I urge you, the students of Boston College, to stand up for the right to speak up. The fact remains that we have been silenced for too long, and it is finally time to restore our rights on the heights. Thank you.